How far from home, number 439. How far from home my heart stands on, I bent my steps, the watchman speak. The long dark night is almost gone, the morning soon will break. Then weep no more, but speed thy flight, with hope's bright star thy guiding. Till thou shalt reach the realms of light in everlasting day. I ask the warrior on the field, this was his soul inspiring song with courage. turn with us to number 371, Lift Him Up. Lift Him Up. Speaketh, 
Let them hear again the story of the cross, the death of shame, and from tongue to tongue repeat it, mighty throng shall bless his name. Lift him up, the risen Savior, high amid the waiting throng. Lift him up, to see the speaker, now he bids you plead from wrong. Oh, then lift him up in singing, lift the Savior up in prayer, he the glory. Redeemer, all the sins of men did bear. Yes, the young shall bow before him, and the old their voices raise. All the deaf shall hear Hosanna, and the dumb shall shout his praise. Lift him up, the risen Savior. I amid the waiting throng, lift him up to see the speaker, now he bids you plead from wrong. All right, will you turn with me to number 384, safely through another week, number 384. Safely through another week, God has brought us on our way. Let us now a blessing seek, waiting in his course today. Day of old, the week the best, emblem of eternal rest. Day of old. Okay, just a couple announcements here. Uh, I'm still Tom. I'm dressed up like the high priest. 
And uh, this is a scale model of the sanctuary from the time of Moses. And I have a handout for you tonight with some inserts in it. And I'm told I have three good helpers that are going to help me hand those out after the meeting. Right? So don't leave without one of those. And uh, the sanctuary is about something very important. It's about Jesus, and it's about salvation. That's what it's all about. And with that in mind, then, it, it illustrates many of those verses we have in the Bible. They just jump out. It presents to us a connected system of truth. If something doesn't fit into what the sanctuary is showing, it isn't right. It isn't right. And so there's a lot of ideas out there in the religious world that don't fit into the model of the sanctuary. They are not right. So it's a nice picture for us to understand God's message of salvation in Jesus Christ. A verse I like to go with this is Matthew 1 and verse 21. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He's going to save them from the penalty. He's going to save them from the power. And finally, he's going to save them also from the presence of sin. Now, all of that leads us into three messages in the book of Revelation, those three angels' messages. Because those are the messages in these last days to prepare a people to meet Jesus Christ when he comes in glory. The first one is the everlasting gospel. Fear God and give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of the waters. As we proceed towards the end, that's becoming more and more important to understand God as the great creator and the one who can recreate us. Babylon is fallen. You cannot go to the churches of Babylon and expect them to teach you truth. They've got it mixed up with error. You cannot expect the churches of Babylon to tell you how to call people out of Babylon. They're trying to pull you in, right? So we need to understand what is truth and follow Jesus because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Then there's this warning about that mark of the beast. And in contrast to that, we see the people of God those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's what we want to be, right? We want to be those people who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So I've asked the sisters of song to bring us a song about those three angels' messages. coming again that with me my people forever may reign that they may be ready my coming to see I send forth my angels with messages three the cup master is coming he's coming for thee Oh, haste to me ready, thy master to see. The master is coming, he's coming for thee. Oh, haste to me ready, thy master to see. The first with the message was sent through the land. Fear God and give glory, thus judgment at hand, and worship the maker of earth, sea, and sky, and the fountains of waters who ruleth on high. The second this message of woe did repeat, the church is not ready her master to greet 
She's fallen, backslidden, departed from him, and her love to worse kings has unlawfully given. The master is coming, he's coming for thee. Oh, haste to be ready, thy master to see. The master is coming, he's coming for thee. Oh, haste to be ready, thy master to see. The third message follows the last to begin. To point once again to dying sinners to him. If any the beast or his image adore, on him shall God's judgments abide evermore. The Master is coming, he's coming for thee. Oh, haste to be ready, thy Master to see. The Master is coming, he is coming for thee. Oh, haste to be ready, thy Master to see. The law of the Father, the faith of the Son, must be kept by the church all united as one. The mark of rebellion, refuse to receive. Be sealed with God's seal and eternally live. The Master is coming, he's coming for thee. Oh, haste to be ready, thy master to see. The master is coming, he's coming for thee. Oh, haste to be ready, thy master to see. Before we get to the sanctuary itself, we have to be part of God's people. Though God wanted his temple to be a house of prayer for all peoples, to really participate in it, you need to become part of those people. And so as we go on our way to Mount Sinai, we need to back up and remember where God's people were back in the time of Moses. They were in Egypt. And they'd become slaves in Egypt with hard taskmasters over them, which led them to cry out to the Lord. Now, that's the way it works in our lives a lot of times, doesn't it? Things are going well. We kind of forget about God. Things get hard. Then we decide to call on him. The good news about God is he loves us, and he's willing to be patient with us. And when we call for help, he's ready to help us. So those people in Egypt called on God for help, and God raised up Moses to be the, the human leader of that group. But the real leader was the one that was with them, that rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Yes. So the first step out of Egypt was you've got to get Pharaoh to say they can go. Pharaoh's attitude was, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? He never did find out, did he? He kept disobeying, changing his mind. When the plague came, he said, okay, okay. But then as soon as it was relieved, he, he said go. Finally, with the tenth plague, he let the people go, the death of the firstborn. But in that, there was something very important that happened. God's people had to do something. They had to take the lamb, kill the lamb put the blood around the doorposts because the destroying angel was coming. When the destroying angel saw the blood, he'd go by. That was what, what was set up. So step number one to get out of Egypt, which is where this world is, it's Egypt. 
Step number one is to realize you have a need, call on God for help, and Jesus the Savior comes. His blood shed. As it says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So that's the good news we have. The question tonight for each one of us to think about is, is that blood applied to my life? When the destroying angel comes, the destruction takes place, will he pass by me?
blood is applied. People go from Egypt, but then Pharaoh sends his army after them. And that's always what happens. When somebody tries to follow Jesus Christ, Satan sends everything he can to pull them away, to bring them down, bring them back to Egypt, whatever he can, to keep them in bondage to sin. People were trapped, sea, mountain, and Pharaoh's army coming. But God fought the battle. God opened the Red Sea. They went through and were baptized in the Red Sea. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 10. So they've come to Jesus. They've been baptized. Now they're part of God's people. They're his chosen people. They're on their way now to Mount Sinai. So at Mount Sinai, the people in Exodus, the 19th chapter, say, everything that the Lord has said, how well does that work out? God then spoke his Ten Commandments. Important for us to remember this because Jesus, when challenged by the devil, says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There we have God from Mount Sinai speaking his law in the hearing of his people. That ought to tell us it's pretty important. But then, of course, we know the rest of the story. Not only did he speak it, He took a table of stone, wrote it out with his own finger, gave it to Moses. Those were broken. He had to write out another set, right? He did. And they went into the Ark of the Covenant, not in the courtyard, not in the holy place, but in the most holy place of the sanctuary. Very special. God's law. Because sin is the transgression of that law. That's what it is. That defines right and wrong, good and evil, what sin is, that law. God spoke. And again then, in Exodus, the 24th chapter, two times the people say, everything that the Lord has said, we will do. The very next thing then God does in Exodus 25 is, he says, Moses, take up an offering. Here's what you need. And then in verse 8, he says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The sanctuary is all about how to deal with sin people who have violated God's law. So if the people could do it, they wouldn't need the sanctuary. God already knew they were going to fail. And so in Hebrews chapter 8, we have these words, starting at verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Paul has just spent seven chapters telling us about this high priest whose name is Jesus. We'll talk more about that at the worship service tomorrow. He's a minister of the sanctuary sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. People are always asking me, do you really think there's a sanctuary in heaven? Is God in some little box up there? I said, yes, there's really a sanctuary in heaven. The Bible says so. It's not a little box. The Bible says even in the most holy place of that heavenly sanctuary, there can be thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. It's big, but it's there. The Bible says so. For every high priest is ordained to offer gift and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man, this high priest, Jesus, have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Moses saw it. God told him how to do it. Make it like this. When their work was done, God looked at it and approved, said that's exactly it. That's what you needed to make. So the earthly sanctuary is a picture of the true one in heaven, right? That's what it is. Now, which do you think works better, a picture or the real thing? The real thing. You know, when I was teaching in Russia, my second graders, I I was trying to explain to them the commandments. Now, these these weren't Seventh-day Adventists. These were just, I was in a public school teaching Bible lessons. Try that in this country. All right? My second graders, they, they had a question about, do we need to pray to icons? That's a, a holy picture in Russia. 
Do we need to do that? And well, I didn't want to cause a lot of trouble, so I just read the commandment. And they say, well, uh, well what's wrong with it? Why can't we? What's, what's the problem here? I said, well, what, what would you rather have for a teacher? Would you ra ha rather have me? And then I pulled out my driver's license or a picture of me. And right away they all said we'd rather have the picture. <laughs> okay. I set that on the chalkboard there and I walked out the door into the hallway. Then they called me to come back. I said, okay, I'm back. What's the problem? They said, the picture can't do anything. They had it figured out, didn't they? I didn't need to do much to get the conclusion. The icon can't do anything either. But there is a God in heaven, a living God who loves you, and he can do everything. He's the one we need. So the earthly is a picture to teach us about the true work of our great high priest in the true sanctuary that's in heaven. It's a picture of it. It goes on in chapter 8 of Hebrews, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. The promises of the old covenant, God said, here's my law. The people said, everything the Lord said we will do. They made the promise and they failed. When God makes promises, he does not fail. He keeps his promises. And that's where our faith comes in. We can believe what he says and what he's going to do because he always keeps his promises. And then verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, that is the people. See, the covenant was fine. The, here's God's law. It's holy, just, and good. It's, it's nothing wrong with God's law. The problem was the people promised to do something they were unable to do. Finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So that's going to be an important part of this, the new covenant. Now, I talked to a lot of people who claim to be Christians. I said, did you know you've entered into an agreement with God? I said, huh? I said, it's called the new covenant. Do you know what agreement you've made? Uh -uh. <laughs> and I've even done that with uh, some different pastors, too. They have no idea. But we do. We know because the sanctuary is going to open this up as part of that connected system of truth. So Moses made that sanctuary in the wilderness just like God had showed him, just like God had explained to him. And uh, the very first thing we notice is it's surrounded by this linen wall. Now this is Zebedee. Six foot. It's, a six, it's not a six-foot-tall clothesman. That's a six-foot-tall man. <laughs> uh, children always give me so much trouble. <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's the scale that this is done to. But you have this linen wall around it. It illustrates Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, about our sins separating us from God. God is holy. We are not. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so he's got his tent pitched in the middle of the camp. Over here is the east end, always pointed east here, and that was the way in. And uh, he's got a wall separating us. Now, that, well, that's not very friendly. The white here, Isaiah 118, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. And John says, all unrighteousness is sin. This represents the opposite of sin, which is righteousness. So that's, that's what's surrounding this thing, this white linen wall. And then, this is awfully, awfully bad because, you know, I'm quite a sinner. And if I've got a sin, I'm going to have to come here and bring a sacrifice. And I've got to walk by all of you. Now, we could put that in terms of the church right here. If we did this on Sabbath morning you sinned during the past week and you were bringing your sacrifice, what would the rest of us be thinking? Oh, yeah, there's Tom again. He's got another lamb for a sacrifice, a big old sinner. You are all condemning me, aren't you? That's what you're doing. All right, fine. But here's the good news. There is a way out of this that God has provided for us. And so on the... Uh, 
east side here, there's one way in, a gate. And that one way illustrates, of course, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is just one way of salvation. Muhammad can't save anybody. Buddhism can't. Hinduism can't. False Christianity can't. Only Jesus can save. There's just that one way. And people say, well, you're sure stuck up. You don't have a very open mind or anything else. No, I know the Savior. I know that's the only way. Do you? I hope so. He is the one way of salvation. He also says in John 10, verse 9, I am the door. If any man enter in by me, he shall be saved. So this gate, this, this hanging there, represents Jesus Christ. And he stands there inviting us to come, doesn't he? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He's not trying to destroy us. He's not trying to send us away. He's trying to bring us close so he can work his salvation in our lives. Now, the interesting part about this is it's not just linen. It's got three colors on there, blue, purple, scarlet. And you're going to see those colors all over the place in the sanctuary. They're at this gate here. They're at the first veil, the second veil, the innermost covering over the, uh, the, the tabernacle itself, the tent part here. That's what you'd see if you'd look up when you walked in there. It's all over the high priest robes. It's on the pomegranates there. It's on the curious girdle, the belt. It's on the ephod. It's on the breastplate of judgment. Blue, purple, scarlet. Always given in that order in the Bible. Do you think God's trying to tell us something with those colors? Absolutely. Absolutely he is. So, first one is blue. And uh, we can go to the um, book of Numbers, the 15th chapter. God puts a meaning on it. He says, you're going to put a blue ribbon in the fringe of your garments. And it's to remind you of my commandments, my law. And so that's where we get the idea that blue represents God's law. Well, that's nice. Purple. We go to Mark, the 15th chapter, and we find Jesus being mocked by the Roman soldiers. You can imagine the situation. The, those soldiers are sitting around. They've got two to crucify. They're waiting on the third. And why is this taking so long? We want to have a good fun time over the weekend. We've got to get this work done. And so the message comes from Pilate to the centurion in charge, and he unrolls the charge against Jesus, and it says, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. <laughs> this man is paraded before the great kings of the world, including the Caesar in Rome. And this is a king? <sighs> so the soldiers pick it up right there. I was a soldier. I know how soldiers work. I was in the army for 10 years, so I know how this works. Oh, king, well, king needs a crown. The soldier runs off and he weaves that thorns into a crown, plants it on the head of Jesus. A king? A king needs a scepter. And one gets a reed and starts hitting him with it. So there's your scepter. A king, a king needs a royal robe. And the color of the royal robe is purple. And so... This represents royalty. Scarlet. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Scarlet represents sin because sin is death. Always has been, always will be. The wage of sin is death. It always is death. That's what happens. But... The life is in the blood, it says in Leviticus 16. That's why God gave it on the altar. So sin can be taken care of by the blood of the innocent sacrifice. And when sin is taken care of, God has some promises about that, doesn't he? And so now we're down to the point of this new covenant. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Chapter 8 of Hebrews, verse 10. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. 
Who's making the promise? Does he keep his promises? Yes. He's going to take that law that he wrote on the stone, to take that law that he spoke in the hearing of the people, he's going to write it on the hearts of his people. And when it's written on the heart, I delight to do thy will, O God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Born again, changed, character. All right? Oh, that's the blue. Next promise he makes. I will be to them a God, and they shall be my people. John says in the first chapter of the gospel there, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. As a child of the king, what are you? Royalty. Or as Peter would say, you are a royal priesthood and holy nation of peculiar people. That's what you are. Okay. We go on. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. God has a plan for his royal children in eternity, where you don't have to tell anybody to know the Lord, because everybody does. We're talking about a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. That's where we want to be. That's where we're headed. And then finally, we've got to get the scarlet in here. Verse 12 says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Two parts here. One, he's going to forgive sin. Two, he's not going to remember it. The sanctuary will show us how that's carried out through the blood of Jesus. It's going to teach us this lesson. So, the good news is, I come with my sacrifice, I enter in through the one way, the gate, and now I am protected by that wall of righteousness that's around here. Your peering, condemning eyes can no longer do that to me. I'm with Jesus, <laughs> you see? So it's kind of embarrassing walking through the camp, but once I'm here, all is well. All is well. God has a solution to my problem. Now the problem is yours because you're still out in the camp with your sin. <laughs> you didn't come. But you need to, right? You need to come. All right. So we're going to take down the wall here and look inside. As you would step in that gate, the very first thing you come to is a very large altar. Here's my six-foot six man. <laughs> Very large altar. It's the altar of burnt offering and uh, has the fire burning on there that God has kindled. You come there with your sacrifice and uh, you'll be met with a priest. The priest is there. He's going to make sure some things are right about that sacrifice. First, for whatever business you're there for, it's got to be the right sacrifice, right? And then I have shown up with my three-legged lamb. It's the best I got. I can't do any better. All right. What's he going to say? Out. No. That lamb must be perfect. The priest is going to ensure that. Then what happens next? Okay, I've got to put my hands on the head of this. And this is, this is a wonderful transaction that's taking place now because I'm the guilty sinner, and now that sin is going into this innocent victim. So I lay my hands on And then what happens? Yeah. Who? Me. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people want the priest to do this for them. Right? Isn't that the way we do with our, our pastors? Pastor, you take care of it. <laughs> yeah. The sinner is the one that has to kill the sacrifice. Now, think about it. If we needed to do that, if we had to do that, if that was part of our ceremony to deal with sin, do you think we'd get sick of sin after a while? Yeah, that's the, that's the lesson God was trying to get through. But the problem was the people thought there was value in the sacrifice, and so they thought the more we bring, the more God's going to love us and, and, and accept us. And No, God wanted us to see the horribleness of sin. We just become so full of pride and so callous, we forget how horrible sin is. It's a terrible thing. But we're not dealing with just a, a lamb, are we? 
John the Baptist message in John 1 verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, pointing Jesus out as that Lamb of God. And it wasn't until after the crucifixion that people finally caught on what that was all about, that he had to die for our sins. There was no other way. Jesus prayed that prayer in Gethsemane. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass. If there had been any other way to save us from our sin, God would have provided it. But it had to be Jesus. It had to be him dying for our sins. That's far worse than a lamb. Maybe we need to be softened up again and realize how horrible sin is. It put to death our Savior. My sin put him to death. Lamb is killed. Then the priest is going to take some blood from that lamb, and he's going to come over here to this altar. He's going to touch it on the horns of the altar. That's what he's going to do with it. Meanwhile, the sinner is scraping out the fat of that. It's going to be burned on here. The priest is going to have to eat some of it, so he's going to become a sin bearer. The horns represent power, strength. And so when we think about that, there's power in the blood, you know. There's power of, of redemption and forgiveness of sin in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's that blood of Jesus Christ that brings us near to God, taking away that separation that sin has caused. Uh, it brings peace to our lives, that, and, and it washes us. There is power in the blood of Jesus, and it's available for us tonight. Still there for us, still there. When we look at that then, what God has done, God who so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He took our humanity. He took our sin at the cross, separated from the father there. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He cries out. When we see what Christ has done, that we can be forgiven, that we can be saved from our sin, it ought to, it ought to soften those hard hearts of ours up. It really should. So, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride.
So at the gate, Jesus encourages us to step through with the promises of the new covenant, to write the law in our hearts, to make us part of his family, the royal uh, family of God, and, and then to take care of that problem of sin that we have. Forgive it, and finally, to remember it no more. So when the sinner comes to the altar of burnt offering, goes through that ceremony, he walks out forgiven, and an atonement has been made. As we proceed onward, though, we want to talk about the laver. The laver was a pot of water. Uh, it was made from the women's mirrors. They had shiny brass mirrors, like a band instrument today, we would think of, you know. And I think the women figured out that it was more important to look to Jesus than themselves. We don't need the mirrors. If you spent as much time with Jesus as you do looking in the mirror, would you be a better Christian? Next time you look in the mirror, think about it. Anyway, this was a pot of water. Before the priests would serve either at the altar burnt offering or in the tabernacle, in the holy place, or most holy, they would come here and wash their hands and feet. Now, many people want to make this into a baptism. It's not. Baptism took place at the Red Sea, right? This is for the priests. These are for people that... Uh, are servants of God. They have been baptized. They're, they're now going to work for God. But before they do that, they must come and wash their hands and their feet. Now, do we do anything like that? At communion, we call it the ordinance of humility. Washing feet, right? My sinful hands take my brother's sinful feet and wash them off. And then his sinful hands take my sinful feet and wash them off so we can go to the table of the Lord, meet with Jesus, and then go out and serve him, right? Yeah, that's what this is about. And it's quite interesting that this courtyard here is illustrating 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. A complete new start a wonderful thing to think about no matter how deeply you've gone into sin or how casually or whatever you can bring it to Jesus and you can have a new start a clean slate that's what we need all right as we move on now we come to the tabernacle the tent part itself here it has four coverings over it the first one King James Version calls badger skins it was some sort of a skin covering and it was plain very much illustrating the way Jesus was because Isaiah describes him as there's no form or comeliness that we should desire him. Ordinary human being. Not a magnificent angelic type of character, just an ordinary human being. Under that, another co covering of skins. This is ram skins dyed red. wonder what that would be about. All the way through this, we need the blood of Jesus, right? from the altar all the way through every service involved. His death is so significant, so important. Underneath that is a covering of goat's hair. And then under that, there we have those colors again, blue, purple, scarlet, embroidered with heavenly scenes. So this would be the ceiling as you walked in and looked at it. The walls, of course, were uh, boards covered with gold. So inside would be very beautiful because you have some lamps burning and you have all this gold and it's reflecting off of it. And so it's like Jesus. It wasn't the exterior beauty that attracted people. It was his beautiful heavenly character, that character filled with love. That is what attracted people to Jesus. The beauty's on the inside, on the inside. Good lesson for us. We'll pull that down. So this is divided into two rooms. We call that one the holy place. We call this one the most holy place. Now, this is a picture of heaven. There's a sanctuary in heaven. Do you suppose there's a holy place in heaven and a most holy place in heaven? Because this is a picture of it. Absolutely. And then there were services that took place in the holy place every day during the year. Do you suppose there are services in the heavenly sanctuary in the holy place? Mm -hmm. And then once a year was the Day of Atonement, and that's when the high priest could go into the most holy place for that service. 
do you suppose there's a most holy service in the heavenly sanctuary? A day of atonement? A day of judgment? Yes, absolutely. So you can see how this is putting all these interconnected pieces of God's word together into a one picture. So we're going to look at this holy place a little bit. Three items of furniture in there. The first one is table of showbread. And on it were two piles of bread, six, six uh, loaves in each pile there, covered with frankincense. Uh, so that's one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Is that enough to feed a tribe? In the hands of Jesus it is, right? He can take five loaves and two fishes and feed those 5,000 men and women and children to the besides. In the hands of Jesus enough. So one of the lessons we get from this table of showbread is God provides for his people. He provides physical food. Every time we're eating something, uh, you know, our food, we are eating a gift from our Heavenly Father, something He's provided for us. And so it should remind us of that. God does provide, and we can be thankful for His provision. But there's, there's more to this, because Jesus came along and He said, John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. It has to do with Jesus, doesn't it? The bread of life. And we find that as Jesus goes on in John chapter 6, he explains what he was talking about because he tells the people there, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. So some people take that literally, right? Say, okay, so then uh, at communion I have to have bread that becomes his actual body and and this, this uh, drink here has to become his actual blood, or I'm not doing what he says. Well, that's not at all what Jesus meant, because he explains what he meant in the 63rd verse of that chapter. He says, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So Job could say, I value your word, this is in Job the 23rd chapter, I value your word more than my necessary food. Now I've contemplated doing this with pathfinders and, and I'm not bold enough to, but I've often wondered if I gave them a choice, you can have your food if you give me your Bible permanently or you can keep your Bible and go without the meal. What do you suppose they'd do? I've pondered. And I think the answer that usually comes around is probably correct is they easily give me the Bible because I figure I'll get one, another one anyway. It's pretty callous, though, when you think about it, isn't it, to treat the Word of God that way? It's the bread of our spiritual life. So, you know, how often do you eat a, every day? This is where I like to have children help me, but you're all highly educated Christian children, it won't work, will it? Because I want to make an agreement with them, see? To save their parents money and time. So they can have more time with their parents and stuff. And it's, you get one meal a week. That's my f agreement. But I first start asking them, how many times do you eat in a day? And the, the I had one young man say 10 times. <laughs> wow. And when you a tell them, all right, here's the agreement. One meal a week is all you get. And the normal answer by these good young people is, I'd starve. And they're right, aren't they? Yeah. And that's what we as Christians often think we're going to do. I can forget about Jesus during the week because I'm going to church on Sabbath. And there I'm going to get spiritually fed. And usually those people walk out and say, boy, the pastor's sermon is so rotten. I didn't get anything out of it. Well, that's because you haven't put anything into it. You haven't been with Jesus during the week. <laughs> if you'd been with Jesus during the week, you'd get there. And if he didn't have anything in it, you can give him something. <laughs> right? Instead of complaining about him, give him something. Give him a blessing. Lift him up. But uh, the bread of life. Think about it. Spend as much time with Jesus and the Word of God as you do 
growing food, buying food, earning money to buy food, preparing food, eating food, and cleaning up after the meal. Would we be Christians? Oh, my. The bread of life, Jesus. Across the way from there was a seven-branched lampstand. It had these seven oil lamps on there, and the priest had to come in there. They replaced that bread on that table every week, fresh bread. These had to be trimmed and burned and filled with oil on a daily basis. And that was the job of the priest. And this is what we see Jesus doing in chapters 1, 2, and 3 of the book of Revelation. He's doing his work as the priest, tending the lamps, his church. Jesus comes to us in John 8, 12 and says, I am the light of the world. That's a good thing because this world's in darkness. It needs light. It needs light. They're calling good evil and evil good now big time, aren't they? I come from Iowa City. It's Sodom. Next door neighbors. It's right there. It's all over. Being shoved down everybody's throat. And if you say anything contrary, somehow you're the bad person. I love these people. I don't want them to burn in the lake of fire. I want them saved in the kingdom of God. Oh. Light. This world needs light. Jesus is that light. And so we need Jesus. He turns around, though, in Matthew, the fifth chapter, and says, Ye are the light of the world. Meaning us, right? We're to let our light shine so that the Father in heaven may be glorified. That's what we need to do. Where are we going to get this light? We're back to the word of God, aren't we? Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. It will lay out the right way to go. It will tell us what is right and wrong. And best of all, it shows us Jesus, the light of the world. And we, he, we want him to be the light in our lives as well. So that's seven-branched lampstand. So the first one is then about spending time, the table about spending time with God in his word making it part of your life just as much as that piece of bread you eat becomes part of your life. Then we have the lampstand. We're to be witnesses for him. You cannot be a Christian. See, here's where we get justification. Now we're talking sanctification, you see. How do I live the Christian life? The bread of life, that word of God coming in, witnessing. You can't be a Christian unless you witness. You're not one unless you are. It's that simple. As soon as you come to Christ... There's born in you a desire to share this wonderful good news with other people. And then, what else does it take to grow in Christ? We have the altar of incense. Incense, Psalm 141, verse 2 tells us, represents prayers going up. But not just our prayers, because our prayers aren't worth real uh, a whole lot. Uh, you, you've read that in Romans 8, verse 26, haven't you, about how we don't know how to pray as we ought or what to even to pray for. But the Spirit intercedes for us, groans and mutterings that we can't even understand. And Jesus, it says later in chapter 8, also is interceding for us. So we have the righteousness of Christ, we have the working of the Holy Spirit that takes our feeble prayers and makes them perfect, presents them to the Father, and He will give the perfect answer at the right time to those prayers. Send them up in faith. And that's what it is. Incense smells sweet. Our prayer may not be worth much, but God loves it. And he'll take it and make it into a perfect prayer with the incense of Christ's righteousness. So what does it take to grow in Christ? It takes the word of God becoming part of our lives. It takes witnessing and lots of prayer. That's what we need to be doing, right? Yeah. The last part of this then, the most holy place, there's that Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments inside, right there. And that's set apart for a very special work in a very special day, that Day of Atonement, in the earthly services once a year. In the heavenly, we have an announcement in that first angel. That announcement of the hour of his judgment has come comes out of Daniel 8 and verse 14. And that goes back to Leviticus 16. But all of that is tomorrow night. So we're not going to do much with that right now, are we? So tomorrow, we're going to do the high priest. We're going to learn some lessons of salvation from his clothing. And then tomorrow night, we're going to do that Day of Atonement and what that's all about. So we have a closing song, Let Every Lamp Be Burning. And that's number 595.
Would you please stand with me as we sing the closing hymn number 595. Let every lamp be burning. Let every lamp be burning bright, the darkest hour is nearing, the darkest hour of earth's long night, before the Lord's appearing. Then trim your lamps, my brethren dear, then trim your lamps with godly fear. Master's coming draweth near, let every lamp be burning. Though thousands calmly slumber on, the last great message burning, we'll rest our living faith upon His promise of returning. feel free to come up and look at this ask me questions that's all fine and make sure these young people give you the handouts let's pray shall we father in heaven we are so very thankful that you brought us to these holy hours of the sabbath day time we can put away all the foolishness of this earth all of its sin and and troubles and we can come near to you and learn of you and be blessed by you I pray for each one here, Father. We indeed have that blood of Jesus applied to our lives. We've stepped forward, joined with your people, and not just your people, but your remnant people. And as we look unto Jesus, he will guide us safely home, safely to that heavenly place he's gone to prepare. So I pray for each one here that that's indeed our condition. If not, I pray your spirit will not let us rest, but rather bring us to the Savior. As we go from here, guide us safely along our way, and thank you for loving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.